Hi, everybody. In baseball, I think one of the toughest pitches that anybody can see, throw, catch, or even hit is the knuckleball. Well, our guest today was a master of that pitch for 25 major league seasons. He won 216 games. And it's always a pleasure to welcome our old friend, Charlie Huff. Charlie, how are you? I'm just fine, Ross. Thank you. Thanks for having me with you. Well, Charlie, let's start at the very first. You were born in Honolulu. I'm going to guess that's because your father was in the military. Is that right? Military style was in during the war and stayed in the Air Force. And I uh, had a brother born in New York right before me. And then uh, I came along in January 48. Mm. And as I recall, your father was a prisoner of war. Yeah, a little over three years. Um, yeah, tough times, tough times. And, uh, you know, he got through it, lived through it, and uh, quite an experience. Was that in the Pacific Theater? Yeah, yeah, he was uh, in the Philippines. Wow. How old were you at the time, or had you been born yet? No, I wasn't born until after the war. Okay. Yeah. So it was very, tough, very tough for your mom, but, but fortunately, it all worked out. Yep. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little story that uh, I just remembered the day. I believe it was the first year I was with the Dodgers, 1977. And you're playing an exhibition game in, uh, I think, St. Petersburg, maybe. And that night, uh, Len went down and sat with Jerry Doggett's wife, Judy, in the front row next to the Dodger dugout. And here came your dad. And he uh -huh. sat in the same box with them. And it was very cold, very cold. Lynn had been reading the newspaper, and your dad said to her, put that newspaper under your feet for both of you ladies, because it'll keep you warmer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they did. Oh, that's, <laughs> and, uh, that's something my father might say. Yeah. <laughs> All right, eventually you wind up in Florida. You go to high school at Hialeah. Uh, yep. Were you a pitcher all the way, high school days? Uh, I was a pitcher and played first and third. Uh, in my my 10th grade year, my brother was a senior. Uh, we both pitched and played first. So we switched every game. Uh, he, he and I, I think, were the only two pitchers and the only two first basemen. Were you outstanding as a high school pitcher? Um, okay, I'll go with it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, uh, I I guess you'd say I was a typical uh, good high school pitcher. I was pretty big kid, you know. I was six foot in tenth grade, ninth grade. Um, so and I could throw. I I, I wasn't throwing a knuckleball then, uh, uh, but yeah. I threw fairly hard. I had decent stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So in 1966, the Dodgers draft you in the eighth round. Yep. Did anybody else uh, go after you that you thought you might sign with? Uh, you know what? Uh, in that in that era, um, there wasn't much news to a kid about the draft. I mean, there was nothing on TV. You heard about it. You got a phone call and, uh, hey, the Dodgers drafted you. Yeah. Um, that, that was about it. I mean, maybe the first rounder type guys did. But uh, back then, no, no, there was like no news at all. And that was the second year of the draft, wasn't it? Right, right. Yeah. It was It was not as, I guess you'd say, comprehensive, uh, well-disguised. And <laughs> So, in 1966, stuff. you make the yeah, I mean, Dodgers, and uh, you wind up going to the minor leagues, and you're in the minor leagues for about, about, about four years. Uh, I think you were at uh, Ogden, Santa Barbara, uh, Albuquerque. And finally, you got to the Dodgers and stuck with them beginning in 1970. Um, what were your thoughts then as you came up? Um, I, I thought it was, it was a shock to me because in 1969, um, I had a sore arm and I was a starting pitcher in double A with a sore arm. And I got really, really lucky. I got to go to the instructional league that winter and a Dodger coach, and you might remember him, Goldie Holt. Goldie Holt. Uh, Goldie Holt asked me the first day, have, have you ever tried to throw a knuckleball? And I said, no, show me how. And I started throwing it. 
Were you effective with it at first? I could throw a good knuckleball almost right, almost right away. Uh, huh. And Tommy was the manager, Lasorda was the manager, and he gave me a chance uh, the next spring to pitch in AAA with him. And, you know, I ended up having a great year and got to the big leagues. Now, that would be at Spokane. Right. That, when you right. talk about a great year, yes. You uh, led the league, Pacific Coast League, in saves. You also had an ERA of 1.0. Nine five, so that puts you in pretty good position, didn't it, Charlie? Or uh, yeah, oh, spring yeah. training the next year. Yep, yeah, and I had a good spring, which which normally I didn't, but uh, <laughs> the next spring I had a good spring and made the club, and didn't get the pitch hardly at all. <laughs> Got sent down. Well, I was going to say it seemed like you were, did not really become uh, what would you say a full time bullpen man until 1973. So what, what right. about all those few years before that? Did you just get into to a few games uh, along the way? Well, it, it was, you know, Walter was the manager and it was real tough in that era to break in to the big leagues as a knuckleball relief pitcher, especially yeah. one that's really wild, which yeah. I was. Um, so no, they, they sent me down. Actually, you know, it hurts to get sent down, yeah. but it was the best thing that happened to me. If you can recall there, um, the Dodgers in 71 signed Hoyt Wilhelm. Yeah. So I got to work and play with, I got to play with Hoyt in Spokane, uh, wow. for about a half a year. And then, and then the Dodgers called him up and left me down there. But <laughs> I, again, it was, it was a good move on their part, although it hurt at the time. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you make your major league debut with the Dodgers, uh, I guess, in uh, 1973, would it be? First well, time I, got, I got to stay all year and yeah. pitch quite a bit, yeah. And uh, you stayed with them until 1980. Um, yep. Besides Goldie Holt, was there anybody else along the way that you really uh, can credit for your success? Well, Tommy gave me the chance. He, he was, uh, I guess you'd say, my biggest backer, especially coming up to the minor leagues. Um, and, and Red Adams, you could not ask for a better pitching coach. Uh, the, the, whole orga the whole Dodger organization uh, from Peter O'Malley on down was, it, it was crazy good. I mean, they treated young players terrific. Huh. As you look back on your career, what was the highest number of pitches you ever threw in one game? Um, later on, when I, when I became a starter in Texas, I know I threw 170 in a game. Um, I went. I, I remember the game because I went 13 innings. Wow! And I asked why they were taking me out. You know, I mean, nobody ever thought about what a pitch count was. I mean, oh, you no. just pitched until you either look like you're going to lose it or not. Yeah. Well, you were converted into a starting pitcher when you got to the Rangers, and you pitched with them for, from 1980 to 1990. In fact, you had a, yeah. a wonderful time uh, with the Rangers. I think when you left, you were the franchise leader in wins, also in strikeouts and complete games. Um, they kind of called your pitch a dancing knuckleball, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, it was it was really hard for me to get it over the plate. Um, my ball moved a lot and, uh, you know, I battled it the whole career, but I had a real good stretch there in Texas for sure. Now, there's one game that our producer, Mike Cuter, remembers that you threw. And uh, he says you got, uh, what was it, uh, four strikeouts in an inning against the Yankees? Ball gets away from Petrali now. Got him. Got him. That's the third strikeout. They want to try to keep you inside the ballpark. That's called strike three. So a very unusual inning for Charlie. I guess so. I can't. I can't even remember. But, uh, um, <laughs> I I know I had a few pass balls and wild pitches involved. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, one year you led uh, the American League with 17 complete games. And of course, today, and this always surprises me, Charlie, you look at the last couple of years in the major league, and then with the National and American Leagues, you can't believe this. 
The most complete game thrown by anybody has been three. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that a shock? Um, we managed the game totally different. Um, it's a five to six inning starting pitcher and and load up. That's why we use so many pitchers as we're loading up that bullpen with as many good pitchers as we can get in the whole organization. That's why you use so many. And for several years now, and you touched upon it, the average start of a major league pitcher is five and one third innings. Yeah. Yeah. I can believe that. Yeah. You know, the Dodgers have used 30 pitchers this year. Wow. That's more than I would have thought, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have guessed 18 and I would have been far short yeah. when I did this. Um, what about your battery mates? How about your catchers? Uh, a lot of guys had to handle you over 25 years. Oh, yeah. Uh, Who do you think was the most effective at handling your knuckleball? I still believe Steve Yeager's the best catcher, certainly that I ever pitched to, maybe the best I've ever seen. Catching, mm. throwing, blocking a ball. Um, he, was, he was special, a little different than everybody. And in Texas, um, I had a guy that uh, was had been let go as a minor leaguer, released by the uh, Toronto Blue Jays. We signed him as an emergency. His name was Gino Petrali. He <laughs> taught me for years. I, I would assume that I won more games pitching to Gino than anybody. Absolutely loved the guy. Yeah, he, you, he did a great job. Yeah. He's the, he was the next name I was going to give to you. In 1987, Gino Petrali caught Charlie Huff one night, and he committed four pass balls in one inning to tie the major league record. <laughs> well, we, we went to tie a few records with. That, that, I tell you the truth, that that's the guy that I absolutely love because he didn't care if it was a pass ball or a wild pitch or about a stat, anything. He just wanted to win the game and. Uh, we, we, we did manage to win a few. I loved him. I, I would say that is there any other pitch as, as difficult to, to, to catch? Well, I doubt it. I'm Phil Negro, um, 300 game winner. Yeah. Um, in fact, he's the only knuckleball pitcher to win 300. And one of his catchers uh, was the funny man, Bob Euchre. And of course, he has that famous statement. Uh, he said the, uh, the way to catch a knuckleball is to wait until it stops rolling and then go pick it up. <laughs> but uh, is, is the word knuckle used in knuckleball really not the way it is? I've been told that it's more fingernails than it is knuckles. Is that right? It, it, I, I tell you the truth, I, I think everybody that's thrown it at least pretty well, a big leaguer, is so is it with two fingers and it's thrown with the first two fingernails. Yeah. I, I think the knuckleball term came along because they could see your knuckles sticking up. Uh, you know, as, as you're throwing the ball, you can see the hand. Um, but it's thrown basically with the fingertips, fingernails, pushing the ball out. Yeah. Uh, look at some other things about it. Wilbur Wood, uh, Joe Negro, and R.A. Dickey. I uh, yep. won the Sporting News Pitcher of the Year Awards in 2012. Dickey became the only knuckleballer to ever win the Cy Young Award. How many pitchers in Major League history have used the knuckleball as their primary pitch? Wow. I would say because there have been, there was a stretch with a lot of guys, I'd say 50 or plus. Well, very good. 33. Okay. All reference <laughs> is. And um, yeah. you know that you rank third all time in major league games pitched by knuckleballers. I didn't three. know that. I know, I know it's got to be Hoyt Wilhelm on Hoyt top. Wilhelm was number one, 1,070 games. Wow. Bill Necro was in 800. And 64, only six more games than your 858. Wow. 
and rounding out the top 10 of knuckleball pitchers and games they were in would be, and I want to ask about this before we get past this list of names, Joe Necro, Eddie Fisher, Wilbur Wood, Dutch Leonard, Tim Wakefield, Ted Lyons, and Jesse Haynes. Tam, Tim, our friend Tom Candiotti was in the top 15. Did Joe Necro throw that many knuckleballs, Charlie? Well, when he came up, uh, he was not a knuckleball pitcher. No. When he first came up. Uh, of course, he had some pretty good teacher there, big brother Phil. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, he was not strictly a knuckleballer. But when he started throwing it, he was a knuckleballer. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Did you, over the years, have a chance during regular seasons to, to talk to other knuckleball pitchers, maybe before the game, stand in the outfield or something, and, and discuss discuss about the knuckleball and what they were doing and, and, and just try to trade some stories about it? Yeah, I was real fortunate. When I came up, Phil was a star. And my first year, I got to meet him, uh, showed me a few things with his grip. And then, as I said, uh, we signed the next year, we signed Hoyt Wilhelm. And, you know, there's really nobody around to help teach you a knuckleball. Yeah. You, you know, and especially when things go wrong. Uh, what am I doing to make it wild or not, not working right? Um, it takes somebody that, that's done it. And I was fortunate to meet a few guys that had done it and done it as good as anybody had ever lived. It's been said that the lower velocity of the knuckleball is credited with giving um, some who use it the ability to pitch more often and uh, to sustain pitching careers longer than those who rely on their fastball to, uh, to get out. And uh, when you look at it, Hoyt Wilhelm was, uh, was nearly 50 when he gave it up. Uh, let's see who else in here. Uh, Phil Necro was 48. You were 46. Uh, Tim Wakefield was 45. Um, really, really helped careers, didn't it? Oh, well, for, for me, uh, it made my career. I mean, without, uh, without throwing a knuckleball, without Goldie Holt saying to me, hey, have you ever tried to throw a knuckleball? Uh, I would have been back in Hialeah the next year. So <laughs> there would have been no career, but uh, I was fortunate to have their good coaching and I was fortunate that I could do it. I could throw it. Yeah. This is kind of a funny note. The 1945 Washington Senators had a starting pitching staff that included four knuckleball pitchers. <laughs> and the result was they finished second and lost by a game and a half uh, in their league. The team had three catchers, and between them all that year, they combined for 40 pass balls. Oh, wow. Well, that's before they came up with the glove, the, with yeah. the bigger glove. That was before they came up with the bigger glove, which I think uh, Paul Clint, Richards designed. And Clint Courtney was one of the first ones to use it with Hoyt, wasn't he? Yep, I believe so. Yeah. And they said that the, the glove that Courtney used was 50% uh, larger than the conventional mitts used at the time. But that was 1960. Yeah, yeah, with Baltimore, I believe. Yeah, as they broke in. Um, well, moving back to your career, um, you joined the expansion Florida Marlins for the 1993 season. And I will never forget the first regular season game in Marlins history. Charlie Huff was the starting pitcher against the Dodgers. Yeah. He pitched a wonderful game. He went six innings. He picked up the victory. That's got to be one of the highlights of your career, Charlie. Wow. You know, it, it was crazy because up until that year, no, no team in Florida, no big league team. And uh, I, I grew up, my high school was 10 miles from that old ballpark, the old Joe Robbie Stadium. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as a typical high school kid, 
you go to spring training games and then the teams leave and you don't hear anything about them. But uh, oh. to to get to pitch that game against Tommy and the Dodgers, um, it was as a single thrill, one ball game, as good as it could be for me. Well, I was going to ask you, do you think, you think the most memorable game you ever pitched was that um, one? I would say so. As far as one game, I didn't start a World Series game. I got in a few, but this one game was pretty special. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And you were under to win 216 games in the major leagues. Retired at the age of 46 yes. after the 1994 season. You probably know this. You were the last active player who have been born in the 1940s. Yeah, yeah, I heard that. Uh, Nolan had uh, retired, Nolan Ryan had retired the previous year. So I jumped in there for a year or so, yeah. But you mentioned Nolan Ryan. He yep. pitched 27 seasons. That's the major league record. I got to play with him, two of them. Tommy John is right there, I think 26, year 25. You gotta be there in the top five. And so you already, don't you? Oh, yeah. But probably, probably. And there's nobody better than Nolan Ryan. No. Seven no-hitters. No wow. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I saw one. Sandy Koufax was second with four. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever pitch a no-hitter in Myers? Uh, I never pitched a no-hitter anywhere. Um, I had a, I just missed a no-hitter. Uh, against the Angels here at Anaheim Stadium with uh, one out in the ninth. Uh, mm -hmm. We made an error, ended up playing the infield. The guy got the third on it, and uh, uh, we played the infield in. They gave us a <laughs> ball single through the infield. That was the only hit. I oh. lost the game, though. <laughs> what opposing batter gave you the most trouble? Well, the one that I really didn't want to pitch to was uh, – he was basically a backup catcher and a very good one, but his name was Mark Salas. Was mm. in the game for a long time. Um, he was just a guy that I felt like I threw the ball right down the middle to him every time he walked up there. I mean, mm. it, I, I got you know I was fortunate to get to face an awful lot of different hitters and a lot of great, you know. But percentage-wise, I don't think anybody hit me harder or further or more often than Mark Salas. <laughs> By contrast, who are you most proud of the way you pretty much handled him and he was a great hitter? Ah, wow. Uh, I'd have to go with George Brett. Really? I, I had really good luck with George Brett. Um, I first faced him in 1980 when he was had a shot at hitting 400. Yeah. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I have no idea why he had a hard time hitting me, but thankfully he didn't. Well, you leave baseball as an active player and you begin a coaching career. And you coach for the San Bernardino Dodgers. You then were the pitching coach for the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1998 and 1999. Later pitching coach for the Mets. Then after that, some years later, you were pitching coach for, I guess, the independent Fullerton Flyers. And after that, with the Inland Empire 66ers. Did you enjoy being a pitching coach? Oh, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Still, still working for the Dodgers uh, in less of a capacity than an everyday coach. But uh, I didn't like the travel part, but I, I just loved coaching the minor leagues. Absolutely enjoyed it. And you are still part of the Dodgers organization, aren't you? Yes, I work uh, in the player development department. And basically, I kind of fill in for pitching coaches that get a week off of vacation during the season. And I, I go to the uh, instructional league every year. So I'm getting ready to go now. <laughs> Good. Have you had many young pitchers say to you, Charlie, teach me how to throw the knuckleball? Um, a couple of kids have asked me, but really, uh, we haven't had a guy uh, make a, 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 what you'd say, a big attempt to be a knuckleball pitcher. We've had so many good young arms here. It's, it's incredible. So I, I think our sights are more tuned into that. Uh, maybe someday we'll get somebody. 
your two years as the Dodger pitching coach, uh, who impressed you? Who really came along faster than maybe you thought he would? Uh, Darren Dreifert was the guy that, yeah. you know, if I had to pick a guy that uh, I guess you'd say he came along quick and he just had so many injuries. It was incredible yeah. how hard it he was. It was a shame. He, he, could, yeah. he could have had an outstanding career. Oh, big time star. Big time okay. star and could okay. hit it as far as anybody. Yeah. And you remember that year before the Seattle was first in the draft, the Dodgers were second. They couldn't decide the the uh, writers who'd be chosen first, Darren or Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. Yo, and, well, that's and tough. Seattle yeah. took Alex Rodriguez. Yeah. 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 That, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that was a tough pick. I would assume that was, that was a big time tough pick. Yeah. Well, anything else about baseball you'd like to touch upon? Oh, just how good it is. I, I, I just think the players today are terrific. They, they don't manage the game. They don't run the game as it was run when I was playing. But the players themselves, they're just kids getting to play, and they are bigger and they're stronger and they're faster. I, I think they're better than ever. Yeah. Dodgers have really had an outstanding year considering all the injuries to their pitchers, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of a, a tribute to the minor league department here is with the amount of guys that we've sent there to do a good job for them. So that's, that's our job is to, when somebody goes up, we're trying to replace them. Yeah. Well, I'm going to step aside from baseball for a moment. Uh, I want to know how many people uh, out on the website today uh, were Elvis Presley fans. Ah, I know There's of no one, one here. <laughs> I know of no one who was a bigger Elvis Presley fan than one Charlie Huff. Well, we got uh, another one uh, sitting there, sitting uh, around here in the tell, house chair. Tell, tell us your memories about that. Oh yeah, well, he was great. I mean, I got to see him a few times. Um, Did you ever meet him? You know, I was backstage with. Uh, we had a day game in Cincinnati in uh, in '77, not long before he passed away. Uh, I think it was his next to last show. I was backstage uh, waiting to meet him and he was late and not doing well. And I didn't, they rushed him up on stage. I never did meet him. Wow. Yes. He died in August of 1977 yeah, yeah. at the age of 42. Yeah, I, you, I you were, with the, were you with the Dodgers when he died? Yeah. You remember yeah. what, where, where you were and what the shock you had? Uh, we were here. Yeah, it was a shock. We were home. Um, and I, like I say, I was just, I just saw a show in about a month and a half, two months before. And it was an amazing show. Um, you know, the entertainment world lost as big a star as you could be. Yeah. Now, again, I'm going to go back in history with a little memory here. Didn't you and your wife, Sharon, Give your son Aaron part of Presley's name. Oh yeah, Elvis Aaron Presley. Yeah, we went with. I didn't think it would go good with there with Elvis, <laughs> uh, but uh, a lot of people thought it was uh, after Hank, but no, it was after <laughs> Elvis. Oh, that's <laughs> terrific. What was your favorite Elvis uh, record? Oh gosh, I, I, I we were just talking about it today. I, a whole gospel album. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. Yeah. Music. Yeah. You know, everything's just rock and roll. The guy was a great singer and did some gospel stuff that was absolutely incredible. Did you ever get to see him in Vegas? Uh, a few times, about three times in Vegas and a couple of times on the road. Wow. Great talent. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible talent. What, what a shame. Yeah. Charlie, I thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and, and uh, congratulations on your whole career. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at our golf tournament in November. So yep. stay, stay healthy, my friend. I'm planning on it. Thank you, Russ. Charlie Huff's our guest. We'll have more right after this. <laughs> 